Well, good morning. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Dan Kohler, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Alliance. And uh, this is going to be a great season. If you're just joining us, it's going to be a season of hope and uh, finding peace and, and a lot of really good things. I'm excited for today specifically. As I was thinking forward to this, I, I actually thought back to when I was interning in ministry, and I was a youth ministry intern for a junior high in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I uh, got to work with a great team of volunteers. One of those volunteers was a phenomenal guy. He's somebody uh, I would not mind growing up to be. And his name was Rennie Schoonmaker. Rennie Schoonmaker was uh, just a phenomenal guy. He was incredibly talented. Uh, one of the things that I loved seeing Rennie do was sleight of hand magic. And uh, it was all, all the time we would like, hey, Rennie, you should do something for the kids. You should do one of your magic tricks because the kids love it, right? Like they're the ones that want to see it. But like, you know, I was asking for it an awful lot. I remember we got to go, uh, Janine and I got to go over to Rennie's house. Their, their family had us over for dinner and he took me up into their awesome attic. He was also like a really skilled woodworker. The guy was just, he had too many talents. Okay, he was not sharing, he was keeping them all for himself. And uh, so he had just this really amazing attic and this chest of drawers that he had built just for his magic tricks. And he was so good at these things, I would watch him with just awe as I'm trying to figure out how he's doing these tricks. And he would do it, like if you've ever seen somebody do sleight of hand, if they're really, really good, it almost doesn't matter how close you get. Like you can be right up on the person and they do enough to distract you from what's going on behind uh, the scenes that you're not supposed to see that it's, it's impossible to see how it happens. And no matter how many times I would ask, Rennie would never explain how it worked. Apparently there's some code where he can't tell me. But he was incredibly good at it. He, he would distract you enough that you couldn't see what was actually going on. Because all of those tricks, they're relatively simple. But they worked on two levels. One you could see and one you couldn't see. Now it dawns on me that there's so much of our life that's actually like that. There's, there's kind of two layers going on. The one you can see and the one you can't see. And it takes a specific skill to go beyond what you can see to what is behind the scenes. There's so much distracting us on the surface level that it takes a specific skill to look beyond and even then, it can be very, very difficult without lots of practice. This is a skill called beholding. To behold something is to see something. It, it's to notice and pay a, a special attention to something that is happening, usually something or someone that is incredibly important or significant. That is the skill of beholding. Now, this is a season that is filled with increased chaos. Janine and I were just talking about our schedules, and we don't have an open weekend until next year, right? I, I know that's not super far away, but all of the weekends in the month of December are spoken for, and, and maybe beyond that, I don't know. Um, I just kind of go where I'm told to go. That's how things work, and it works best that way. So, you know, our schedule is packed. It's, it's an increased season of busyness. It's an increased season of chaos. And to top that, I just believe that everybody's life has just gotten more chaotic over the last years. Everybody's life has increased in busyness and you add another layer of busyness to it and it becomes very, very difficult to see what's going on that is actually the most important. There are two layers of things that are happening. The one that we can see the one that's most important, and something going beneath the surface. And if we will learn the skill of beholding, there's going to be something especially important for us to grab hold of. If you have a Bible with you today, I want to encourage you or invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. 
If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. You could Google Isaiah chapter 9 on your phone and follow along or follow in your Bible app, or you can follow the screen above. We're going to have it up there for you to be able to read along with. Uh, We're just going to be reading a couple of short verses, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, Isaiah was a prophet A prophet was a mouthpiece of God who spoke the message of God to God's people. Israel was in a rough spot at this time in history. Israel, God's people, were being oppressed, they were being attacked, and they were being made captive by uh, an incredibly powerful nation, the nation of Assyria. You see, God and Israel had a deal worked out And their deal was really simple. God would make Israel great as an example of his own power in the world. And in return, Israel would show through their actions what it means, what it looks like to live in a close relationship with the God who created everything. And the moment that Israel became unfaithful to that agreement, what the Bible calls a covenant, then God would remove his hand of protection. He would stop making them great in the same way. That doesn't mean he wouldn't carry on his purposes in the world, but he would remove his hand of protection. Well, it just so happened Israel had made a lot of enemies over the course of their nation. And when God removed his hand of protection, it did not go well for them. Now they are being attacked and oppressed by the nation of Assyria. And Isaiah is given a message of coming back into alignment for God's people. Isaiah goes and he speaks to God's people. And he says, this is the places, these are all the ways you have come out of alignment with God's agreement, his covenant with you. But if you come back into it, he's going to restore you. It's as simple as that. The the prophets were always about the alignment of the people of God with God, with God's word. And when they came out of alignment, the prophet would come back in and say, hey guys, this is very simple. We've done it a lot. Get back into alignment with God and he will protect you again. It's as simple as that. Now, prophets though, they're tricky. Prophets super tricky because they'll speak to the immediate circumstances that are going on In this case, it's the violence, oppression, and pride of both Israel and Assyria. There's a lot of war going on. There's a lot of death. Those are the things that are speaking the loudest in the lives of Israel and their nation. But then there's this underlying factor. There's an underlying reality that the prophet is also a little bit sneaky. He uses the current circumstances to speak forward to something even greater. In this case, it's a little bit surprising. We read in verse 6, it's about a child. For unto us a child is born. Now, if you were in Israel's shoes and you were being starved, oppressed, attacked, stolen, do you know what the last thing that would sound like good news is? A child. A child. Uh, You know, Israel's no stranger as they're looking forward for a deliverer. Israel is no stranger to a child being in power. They've had a couple of very young kings. One was incredibly young. Took the he took the throne at a very young age. He had to be uh, he had to be protected until he could influence and have his own level of power and influence. They were no strangers to a child, but they also understood something about children. Number one, they are powerless in their current 
state, their current age, their current stature. Number two, even if it is going to be a child who is, who is king and who is deliverer, it's going to be a long time coming. Isaiah is prophesying a child that will be the deliverer of Israel, but the child doesn't even exist yet, and even when he does, it will be some time before anything good seemingly can happen through that child, yet God chooses a child. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but if somebody is in need of being helped, and I have the ability to meet that need, my go-to response is not typically, there's somebody coming along, and when that person gets here, you just wait. It's going to be incredible. They're not born yet. But when they are, watch out, because they'll grow up. And one day, you just wait. It's going to be like nothing you've ever seen. It's not the most comforting promise. I think as, as Isaiah is speaking to Israel, they start hearing everything that's being prophesied, and they're starting to think, I think God needs a new prophet. I think he could get somebody a little bit better then I say, well, maybe we could get a better promise that's for now. But it's God that chooses a child. But here's the genius of the Lord. In the midst of an arrogant Israel, an, air, an even more arrogant Assyria, in the midst of violence and oppression, God chooses something which is the exact opposite of all of those things. Even in the provision, God is signaling the type of God, the type of rule, the type of fix, the type of deliverance that he brings. A child. For, un, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Not just any child, but a child of inheritance. That's, that's the idea behind this sonship. It is a son that will inherit a specific authority from the person in power. Now here's where Isaiah starts to get a little bit tricky. Israel understands succession of kings. They understand monarchies. They understand rulers and authorities. They understand inheritance rights of the son. But Isaiah is not just talking about anybody's son. He's not just talking about a ruler's son. He's talking about the son of God. The son of God who has an inheritance of authority. That kind of son. It is that kind of son, that kind of child who will have the government on his shoulders. Not a human government. I think Israel's hearing this and they're thinking, beautiful, we need a new king on the throne because our last king was not so good and he got us into a lot of trouble. Uh, he, didn't, he wasn't able to protect us from Assyria. He wasn't able to do what he needed to do. He couldn't lead the way he needed to lead. We need a king who can lead us into freedom out from oppression. But Isaiah isn't talking about a human government. He's not talking about the government of Israel through the monarchy. He's not talking about the emperor or the ruler of Assyria. And he's not talking about the political system in America. He's talking about a heavenly government. A different type of rule and reign. A different type of inheritance of authority. One that can only come from God the Father. He's talking about the government of heaven, which is what Jesus in the New Testament refers to as the kingdom of God. That is the government that this child will bring. And if you want that, if you want that kind of government understanding of what it will look like, he gives it in four names. Isaiah reveals what kind of a government this will be by giving the Messiah four names, the deliverer of Israel, of the entire world, four names. The first one is Wonderful Counselor. Counsel in this sense has to do with wisdom. 
that have to do with the way things work. This type of government, this child, this son, will have immense understanding of how things work. The government on his shoulders that he inherits from his father will be a wonderful wisdom and counsel. The next name that is given is Mighty God, the person that is being raised up for the salvation of Israel won't just be another king. He will be one who reveals God himself. In fact, as you zoom forward in time, in the story of scripture, if you pay attention to some of the things Jesus said, he exemplifies this term. There was a moment in time when Jesus is talking about everything that will happen and his disciples are gathered around him. There's a moment in time where Jesus starts talking about going to the Father and one of the disciples looks at Jesus, one of his closest followers, he's spent a significant amount of time with Jesus already, looks at Jesus and he says, show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus looks back at him and he says, have you not been with me? Have I not been with you so long that you don't see it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He and the Father were one. To see one is to see the other. To, to observe one is to observe the other. To see the power of one is to know the power of the other. If you've seen what Jesus can do, you know the heart of the Father, that he is a mighty and powerful God. He would be a deliverer. He would be a God who wields power, but not in the way the world wields power. He would be a deliverer who would save by his might, but not with the might of violence and oppression the way that Assyria does or the way that Israel has tried to accomplish it. He would use his power to free people. He would use his power to bless and to forgive. He would be mighty as God is mighty. The third name given to this child is everlasting father. To see him is to see the father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father, Jesus said. He said, he told his, the crowds and his followers, I only do what I see the father doing. I've only said what the father has given me to say. There's no qualitative difference between the ministry of Jesus and the goodness of God. And in that sense, this name signifies that everything you could ever want out of a loving and perfect father will be exemplified in this child. He will be the perfect father. Always present. Good to give you everything you need. Good to meet your needs. Good to supply everything that is good for you. That's the kind of father this will be. Finally, Prince of Peace. He won't just be a ruler. He's not just a son of a king. He will be a prince of peace. Now, peace seems like it's going to be really good news for Israel, for their oppression, for the violence that is happening at the hands of Assyria. But the problem is that biblical peace isn't just the absence of something. Oftentimes we think about peace as being the lack of strife, the lack of hardship, the lack of, in, in Israel's sense, of violence and oppression. It's not just the ceasing of those things. Isaiah is speaking directly to their circumstances, but he's being really sneaky below the surface. Peace in the biblical understanding is all things being as they should be. Everything is as it should be. Not just a, a lack of strife. Not the ending of violence. But a restoration and a bringing about through his power, wisdom, and goodness, all things as they should be. The last time that that was seen in the world is in creation before God removed people from his presence. 
It's before everything went bad. It's before everything went south. It's before evil and sin entered into the world. This is the promise of God through a child. When, when my kids were born, I had a lot of hopes. None of them were this big. No offense to them. They're great kids. I wouldn't call any of them the Prince of Peace. But that's the promise for Israel. A deliverer is coming. He's going to be wise beyond measure. In fact, it might seem like foolishness, but his wisdom, what seems like foolishness to us will be wiser than the wisdom of humanity. And how do I know that? Because if Israel could have already accomplished what they needed to accomplish through their own wisdom, power, goodness, and effort, they would have. They tried everything they could, but it didn't work. They needed a different type of deliverer, one that even seemed foolish on the surface. And that is the promise of the child. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. Of the greatness, verse seven, of his government, uh, government and peace, there will be no end. The way he rules and reigns, the way he sees things should happen will begin with him and will last for all eternity. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. You see, this is the promise that God has made that though, no matter what Israel did, no matter whether they were faithful or unfaithful in relationship with God. No matter whether they followed the rules or didn't follow the rules, God's promise to save the world through them, through the King David, through his lineage, that promise will never end. It will never waver. You see, God's goal wasn't to make Israel a great kingdom to show the world that if you're in right relationship with God, everything's gonna go well with you. God protected the people of Israel because he made a promise not just to them, but through them that resulted in this child. The greatness of Israel wouldn't be their power or their might. It would be through the Messiah's power, wisdom, and might. That is the promise. He would be a king like no other king. He would reign with a heavenly government, but it would be on an earthly through an earthly lineage. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever, from that time. Uh, one of the things about the season of Christmas that we celebrate in the church is we put ourselves into the position of Israel where they were told there's a promise coming, but it's not here yet. There's a deliverance that's going to come, but you have to wait for it. In fact, uh, Israel waiting for that time that the king would come, that he would rule in, he would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the uh, everlasting father, and the prince of peace hasn't started yet. But once it does, it will last forever. They were in a season of waiting. They were waiting for a child, and then they would have to wait more. And nobody, not even Isaiah, was alive when that promise was fulfilled. God did make good on his promise, and that is what we celebrate in the season of waiting, in the season of Christmas. Not just that Jesus has come in the, in the form of a child, not just that he grew up and he did everything to fulfill these promises. Not just that it will last forever, but now we find ourselves waiting again for his return to finish making things right. That is the promise of Scripture. That is the promise that Isaiah gives from God to the people of Israel. That from the moment Jesus arrives, it's the, that time when all of these things will start happening and it will just keep growing. There's a parable that Jesus tells as he's teaching the crowds. It's a story with truth hidden in it. 
And Jesus was teaching a lot of these parables in this moment, and he said in one of them, he was teaching about the kingdom of God, or in the words of Isaiah, the government of God. And he said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And though it's the smallest of all the seeds in the garden, it produces one of the biggest plants in the garden, so big that it can even provide a, an amount of shade and a place of rest for the birds. That small mustard seed of the kingdom seems insignificant, but it grows up to be quite powerful and good. This is the nature of the child that's promised. And when he arrives, it will be like a mustard seed that is small and seemingly insignificant, almost like a waste of time. But as it continues to grow and progress, as it continues to multiply, as it continues to plant seed in the ground, it will just keep springing up. We have this progressively growing kingdom of God that starts with this child and goes on to eternity. And then there's a beautiful, beautiful line at the end of this section. The last line of verse seven says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We don't use the word zeal a whole lot, and it can be a little bit confusing to us. There's a wonderful quote from scholar John Oswalt that can help us understand the difference between zeal and my, how we might understand it in our terminology. Uh, we might use the word passion or jealousy John Oswalt writes this, zeal and jealousy are two sides of the same concept. Both bespeak, another word we don't use, but maybe we should use a little bit more. Both bespeak a kind of concern for someone that desires an exclusive place, catch that, an exclusive place in that person's affections. Jealousy, as it, is used to, as it is used today, connotes a petty, self-centered, and unreasoning interest. But its better connotation depicts a consuming concern for the other's best and an unwillingness that anything should hurt or destroy another. Isaiah knew that God loved or desired his people intensely, he could not adopt a blasé, disinterested attitude toward them. No, he would not rest until, in the power of his holiness, he had restored them to himself and given them that kind of government which would allow them to find themselves in him. That's good. That's the kind of government this child brings. That's what the zealousness of God produces. The best I often have in my life is a sense of jealousy. I, I love that Oswald contrasts zeal and jealousy because jealousy, as he describes it, is this self-centered interest. It's wanting to take the role and the place that is uh, affectionate, intense, and intimate in somebody else's life, but it's for me. Zealous. Zealousness is wanting the same things, but for the sake of the other. And Isaiah describes the work of God through this child as zealous. The zeal of God will produce this. The zeal of God is what will bring this about. Not his jealousy. God does not have jealousy the way we have jealousy. God has zeal. He wants to be close and intimate and integral into the very core of our being, but it's his zealousness that makes all the difference. You see, he doesn't want that for himself. He wants that for you. If God was just jealousy... He would want it for himself. But when God is jealous for us, it's for our good. It's that drive. It's that drive that produces what needs to happen through the wisdom, power, goodness, and rest, restorative peace of God. I would imagine that if I asked you to think through a time when you acted out on jealousy, 
it didn't go so well. Jealousy drives us to do all sorts of crazy things. It inspires us to do what we would not do otherwise. And the zealousness of God is for our sake, and it drives him to pursue us until we find ourselves in him. Until that moment, nothing will seem as it should be. Until we find ourselves in God, we'll still be searching and lacking and feeling like no matter what we grab hold of, it isn't hitting its mark. There is no sense of perfection. There is no sense of peace. There is no sense of at home as it should be without finding ourselves in the person of God. And without the zealousness of God, we cannot be pursued to the point where we will respond to him and find ourselves there. It won't be the passion of Israel. It won't be the zealousness of Israel or the, the uh, strategic initiatives or the political prowess of Israel that will accomplish this. It will be the zealousness of God that accomplishes this. If we will slow down and behold, there's something for us to capture in this season that was true for Israel then and it's true for us today and it's that the zealous God will deliver you. The zealous God would be the one who delivers Israel and the zealous God will deliver you. Because I think what is good news to Israel is still good news to us today. What Israel was waiting for, we still wait for in its fulfillment. Jesus came he brought that government and it is continuing to grow in influence and power. It is continuing to grow in the world. It is continuing to grow in our lives like a small mustard seed. And one day it will produce exactly what it is intended to produce. We still find ourselves in the season of waiting. Waiting for the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of God where we learn to rely on his wisdom, his power, his goodness and purity, and that day when everything will be as it should be. I was talking with somebody on the phone a few days later, somebody that was very, very close to me, I love dearly, and he was sharing with me a lot of issues going on in his life, sharing about addiction, sharing about crippling anxiety that fueled the addiction. And I started sharing with him the truth about Jesus. And I wish that I could say that the conversation ended with him saying, you know what, I think you're right. I think that's what I need. But he stopped me and he said, I can't get there. I still think that there's this underlying, he, he, this is what he told me. He said, I still think there's this underlying nature of reality that underlies everything, and if I could tap into that, it would help me. And so I just had to ask him the question, how is that going for you so far? How is that working for you? You see, he was approaching this need to have everything as it should be in his life, but he was doing the best he could in his own wisdom, his own power, and his own goodness. But it's not working. And I think there's a lot of us who are in that same place. who are trying to rely on our own goodness, our own power, and our own wisdom to get us to that point of everything being as it should be, but it can't until we rely on the zealous God who is our deliverer. That is the only place of peace. Until then, we'll keep doing what we've been doing and keep getting the results we've always gotten. Until then, we won't be able to find ourselves, not truly, because we can only be found in him. Scripture says that our life is hidden with Christ. That means to find the true essence, the true meaning of life, the true essence of who you are, it's hidden in him, and you have to go 
dig and find it. It's through the promise of a child, a counterintuitive promise for the deliverance of the whole world, and it is the zealous God who pursues you to make it happen. Now, I don't know if you come in this morning where you are on uh, the, the path uh, of seeking out God. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus at all. We're, we're so glad that you're here. It's a good day to be here. Maybe you are years removed from that, uh, but that decision, uh, uh, that moment in time that you made to follow Jesus. The invitation to all of us is going to be the same. It's going to be to behold to learn to behold, not to be distracted by the season, not to be distracted by the chaos of life, but to look beneath the surface to see what God is making available to us in this season. It can start now and it can go on for eternity. It can go on and become an enduring and everlasting life through the zealous promise of a child. Some of us are still waiting we resonate with Israel because we're waiting for those things. We're, we're waiting and we're, we're thinking, when will it come? And I want to give you encouragement this morning to continue waiting, continue hoping in the promise of a child. I believe all of us should put our hope in the promise of a child. We should wait for the hope of a child for a few reasons. The first one, that Isaiah gives us is because the, God's wisdom is better than ours. God's wis, the wisdom of God is wiser than our wisdom. Just as it seems childish to deliver through a child, God's wisdom of how things work is better than ours. Wisdom is a practical knowledge of how things work. And I think if we're honest and we look at our lives, our wisdom can only get us so far, but God's wisdom is wiser. In fact, the Bible says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of humanity. I find that I, I can usually see with a greater understanding in the rear view mirror. Looking backwards always provides clarity. It, it often allows us to see where God has been working. But if we'll practice beholding We'll develop the muscles. We'll develop the ability at a greater level to see what God is doing now beneath the surface, not becoming distracted by the loudest voices, by the sleight of hand. We'll be able to see beneath it and we'll start to recognize the wisdom of God, actively pursuing us, actively understanding how the world works best, which is often counterintuitive to what I think should happen, how I think things should work. If we can learn to behold, we'll see that the wisdom of God is wiser. Another reason we should believe is because the power of God is greater. Israel, through their own wisdom and through their own wisdom, uh, through their own power, tried to appease Assyria. They tried to provide gifts that would, uh, would keep Assyria from attacking them. They tried to pay tribute to their leader so that Assyria would leave them alone. And it worked for a moment. And then Assyria came back and they said, we want more. And the king of Israel at the time said, we can't give you more. That's, you're asking too much. So we will draw up lines of power and we will beat you and Israel lost. Israel worked the way they think they worked the way they thought things should work and they gave their best effort and power but what they forgot is that the wisdom of God is greater is wiser and the power of God is greater. God works in ways that we can't always comprehend, and his power is greater than ours to accomplish what you and I can't accomplish. Final reason I think everybody should wait for the hope of a child is because the peace of God satisfies. It's the peace of God which ultimately satisfies. No other thing, no other person can make things come about and bring them to the point of everything being as it should be. At best, my power and my wisdom can 
(laughs) Give me a break in the chaos. It can bring a little bit of calm to the storm. But the peace of God satisfies because regardless of the circumstances, when you latch on to the person of God, you are given that sense of home, that sense of peace, that sense of everything being as it should be, regardless of the circumstances. Everybody looked at Jesus weird because he was able to sleep in the midst of storms that everybody else thought was going to kill them. He could have his life threatened and he simply just walked through the crowd, the mob that wanted to kill him. He could stand up against those who wanted to crown him king and just walk away from fame. Because he he relied on the wisdom of God. He knew that the way the world works isn't the way God works and God's ways are better. They're wiser. His power is greater and his peace is everlasting. It's the only place that we can truly find ourselves. That's why we still wait on a child. Not for his first coming that brought the mustard seed, but for the fulfillment when we rest in his branches finally and fully, seeing all things as they should be, finding ourselves ultimately in him on that day. That is what we wait for. That is what we have the chance to behold if we'll learn to see, if we'll learn to look, if we'll pay attention to that spectacular and amazing person that is available to us today. I wanna invite you to close your eyes for just a moment. I believe there are some people here who have not had the opportunity or have not chosen to pursue the way of Jesus. I wanna give you that opportunity this morning. I wanna give you the opportunity to see this amazing thing. I wanna give you the opportunity to look past the surface and to recognize the areas of your life that you are waiting for fulfillment in. That place where God needs to meet you because you've given it all that you know how to give, you've given it all the power that you have. You've come to the end of your own goodness and you still haven't found that things are as they should be. It's because that can only be found in the person of Jesus. And there's a simple pathway to that. It's to turn our trust from what we can do, what we can understand, and what we can accomplish on our own and confess a need for Jesus. And if you haven't done that yet, I'm gonna invite you to pray with me this morning. A simple prayer of trust, humility, and surrender. A simple prayer that says, God, I have pursued this in my own way, and I'm still left waiting and unfulfilled, and I believe that it can only be fulfilled in you. It's a prayer that you can pray in the silence of your own heart. And it's a prayer that will allow you to experience the blessing and promise of the wonderful counselor, the almighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace today and it will last an eternity. It is the only sure foundation. It is the only path to healing. It is the only place that you can truly find yourself. If you're ready to take that step for the first time, I wanna invite you to pray in the silence of your own heart with me this morning. You can just repeat the words I say. The prayer is simple, it goes like this. God, I need your wisdom. I need your power. I need your goodness. I'm choosing to trust in you over what I can do. I invite you into the midst of my brokenness and ask for your healing. I choose to trust you today and forevermore to be the one who guides and directs my path. And I give you all of myself. 
Jesus, I confess you as my hope and my deliverer. And I ask for the power of your spirit to help me choose you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that with me for the first time today, I'm gonna ask you at some point before you leave, just fill out a card one of our connection cards on the back of the seat. Put a little note in there that lets me know uh, that that you have have asked the Lord uh, Jesus to be the Lord of your life and put it in the giving box in the back and I'll follow up with you. I wanna help you take next steps to be able to follow Jesus better. I wanna celebrate with you. I wanna pray for you. I wanna help you experience all things as they should be in Jesus. And if you haven't prayed that prayer for the first time today, if you have said that prayer or some version of that prayer a long time ago, I wanna invite you today to set aside this next season as a season of beholding because God is still wiser than you. He is still more powerful than you and he is still better than us in every way imaginable and every day should be a day of learning to turn our hearts over to him and we have to behold him. Meditate on who he is choose every day to turn back over that trust from self to him. See, see what he is doing beneath the surface, that it's better, that it's good. There's a place for you. I wanna pray over all of us as our worship team comes back up. 